Augusta, can I, can I hand it to you? Um, thank you very much, Richard. Um, let me tell you a little bit what is the game plan for today. Um, I will have uh, about a one minute's worth of an introduction to the subject. I will then introduce the three, the three speakers that we have. We have a very distinguished panel. Um, I will come to that in a couple of minutes. And then uh, each of the panelists has been asked to speak for no more than 15 minutes so that we will have plenty of time left at the end for, I hope, a spirited debate and a question and answer period. Uh, I'm sure that the issues that will be raised by the panelists will be uh, very interesting and very relevant to the subject of today's discussion, which is cosmopolitan democracy and uh, <clears throat> uh, United Nations reform. Um, it seems to me that the last 75 years you know, have witnessed uh, many, many changes in the levels of complexity underpinning our economic, social, and, and environmental uh, and political systems. Some of these changes have been linked to the swift expansion of connectivity and non-linearity brought about by technological and, and scientific innovations. Others have been in response to rapid population growth and the associated expansion of the global economy. And although these forces have contributed to rising living standards and reductions in extreme poverty over the last 30 years, they have also delivered a host of other problems, such as climate change and the associated ramifications, uh, nuclear proliferation, widening income disparities, a vulnerable global financial system, precarious health systems, as shown by COVID-19 during the last eight months, uh, just to name a few. The institutions that, that we have at the national and at the international level are struggling to cope with the challenges of an increasingly interconnected and interdependent world because they have largely failed to adapt to the changes that have taken place to take a time frame in the last 75 years since the UN was created. They have remained frozen in time to a great extent, as has, for instance, been the case with our beloved UN Charter. And the consequences of this is that major planetary issues are being neglected and we're risking being overwhelmed by a broad range of problems, the solutions to which require effective problem solving mechanisms and institutions. So to discuss the ramifications of some of these ideas, um, we have put together, or Mary, I should say, Richard has put together and the organizers of this very fine conference, a, a, a very, very competent panel that together uh, bring decades of experience in looking at these issues. Um, professor Joseph Barata is a, a professor of history and political science at Worcester State University. And uh, I think that for most of us, he's most well known for this absolutely wonderful, compelling two volume uh, piece of work that he did uh, in the early part of, uh, of the century, I, I believe in 2004 to be precise, um, The Politics of World Federation. The first volume was UN, UN Reform and Atomic Control, and the second volume was focused on from World Federation to global governance. So for those of you who have actually looked and read this two volume, um, I think you will agree with me that he brings a singularly relevant experience to the subject of today's discussion. And if you haven't come into contact with, uh, with this two volume um, uh, 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 masterpiece, I urge you to, to please read it. Uh, it's, you can get it in, in, in Amazon and in other such places, and it is really well worth the effort. It is, it is written in a way that is accessible and it's very compelling in terms of the body of historical evidence that he brings to bear on, on these very important issues. After uh, Professor Barata, I have asked Andrea Bommel, who is the executive director of Democracy Without Borders, uh, to speak to us on an idea that he has championed in recent years, which concerns the um, establishment of a World Parliamentary Assembly. 
Um, this is a subject that is very much dear to my heart. In fact, in, in a book published earlier uh, this year called Global Governance and the Emergence of Global Institutions, we dedicate an entire chapter to this. And so Andreas and I are very much aligned with this, uh, with this idea. Um, and I look forward to his remarks. And then finally, we have Shariar Share, who is executive director for the Center for UN Constitutional Research and has been spearheading a, a very interesting debate, um, which by now includes literally hundreds and hundreds of people all over the world on Article 109 in the UN Charter and the prospects for amendments to the UN Charter. So as you can see, you know, this is really a very exciting panel. And without further ado, I will ask uh, Joseph to get us started on this, uh, on this journey. Uh, originally, uh, this uh, conference was in, uh, d in, uh, entitled Democracy Beyond Borders. Um, but later, as the uh, Trump and uh, his administration began to challenge the American democracy, why? Um, the title was uh, changed to uh, How Dem Democracy Survives, the Crisis of the Nation State, particularly here in the United States. Um, I uh, actually uh, am still interested in this larger problem of a democracy beyond borders, and I am a historian of the World Federalist Movement. Um, the crisis that motivated the historic world federalists of 1939 to 50 was not climate change, but the tragic Second World War capped by the first use of atomic bombs. Uh, it's true that their solution was to raise up such a powerful public opinion among the allies and uh, the whole world to hasten the historical development of republics uh, by replacing the new United Nations with a uh, federal government of the world. Um, they, thought, they thought through all the issues of inclusion, representation, powers, and transition that are still relevant today. Uh, for coming to grips with our global problems. The key feature of their proposals was to establish the rule of law reaching to individuals. And this is the step that almost everyone now hesitates to take. Uh, because time is short, I'm going to read the uh, conclusion first of all, and then I'll take a few minutes uh, on the history. The World Federalist Movement left behind certain political principles for a contemporary effort to extend democracy to the whole world. It aimed to build public sentiment prior to action. Like the Civil Rights Movement, it aimed to change the laws. It seized its historic opportunity, which has revived as globalization. It aimed only at official action, rejecting premature appeals to world revolution. It sought gradual action. It cultivated American leadership. Its lasting legacy is the affirmation of the ideal of the rule of world law. Adherence to law is the foundation of real liberty. The law preserves the gains made in popular campaigns. Federalists envisaged a good world government belonging to the people. They had a positive vision of peace, not just the interval between wars. They doubted that the real division of the world was between capitalism and communism but devotion to national sovereignty versus world sovereignty of the people. With the coming of World War II, 
older proposals to establish lasting peace by a union of democratic states were revived on fully federalist principles. Even Immanuel Kant in Perpetual Peace, 1795, went only so far as to propose a confederation of free and independent republics in which the rule of law shared among them would be limited to universal hospitality. But Clarence Streit's Union Now, written in 1939, to prevent war by uniting the democracies, marks the beginning of the world federalist movement. Streit proposed a full union in which the common government would be empowered to enact law reaching to individuals. He argued that the union could effectively coordinate the defensive policies of the democracies and thus exert a predominance of force to overawe the fascisms. He also made clear that the rule of law <clears throat> would be the real foundation of, of freedom as Kant had held. In the course of time to about 1951, the movement had many achievements now usually forgotten and seemingly unimaginable. After atomic bombs were first used in 1945, some former government officials like Grenville Clark, once high in Henry Stimson's War Department, argued that the new United Nations organization was too weak to keep the peace. Clark and a group of politicians, lawyers, journalists, writers, and veterans at a conference in Dublin, New Hampshire in October 1945 proposed immediate UN reform to transform the international organization into a minimal world government based on a popularly elected, that is, democratic general assembly. It was minimal in that the only powers to control atomic energy, as in the subsequent Baruch plan, and to secure subsequent disarmament and supervision of the occupation of defeated Axis countries were thought practical. It was assumed that the wartime alliance with the Soviet Union would hold, and that socialist democracy could abide with liberal democracy. Greater powers were left to future amendment of the UN Charter. It was this vision of limited world federal government that became the policy of United World Federalists, organized in the United States in 1947. We believe, UWF declared at that time, that peace is not merely the absence of war, but the presence of justice, of law, of order, in short, of government. Another view within a week of Hiroshima in 1945 was taken by the Chancellor of the University of Chicago, Robert M. Hutchins, and his dynamic professor of European literature, Giuseppe Antonio Borghese. They formed an academic committee drawn from the West. It proved impossible to attract a Soviet member which drafted a model world constitution to end the age of nations and establish a world federation drawn from nine regions, roughly coincident with Arnold Toynbee's surviving civilizations. The vision was of a new world democratic state subordinating the nation states. They argued that much greater powers, even maximal powers, would have to be drawn from the states and their peoples to achieve not just peace, but also justice. Justice was once defined by Bargese as reconstruction after the war, protection of hard-won economic rights, independence from colonial masters, an end to racism in every form, and assistance for equitable social and economic development. Peace and justice stand or fall together was one of his mottos. Another was world government is necessary, hence it is possible. 
A third wing of the movement was organized in Britain by Henry Usburn, a member of parliament and a socialist manufacturer in Birmingham. He was elected to parliament in the Labour Party landslide of July 1945. Usborne took over an older group, Federal Union, organized like Clarence Streit's group of the same name. Federal Union had some influence on Winston Churchill's proposal of a, of a union with France on the fateful day of 16 June 1940, which later became a precedent for founding the European community. In 1945, after first use of atomic bombs, Osborne immediately concluded that only a world government uniting the democracies could control a weapon that threatened the destruction of all life. At a time when the new labor government was deciding its fundamental foreign policy, either Atlantic Union with the Americans or Western Union with Europe, Osborne was selected to move the acceptance of the King's speech, but Ernst Bebbin, the foreign minister, was unconvinced that world government was the wave of the future. Osborne then decided that if the governments were so slow to realize the necessity of a larger union, he would organize a World People's Constitutional Convention to do so. This was a revolutionary proposal, unlike others which aimed at official action. Osborne then proceeded to visit key democracies in the United States, Britain, France, Scandinavia, and as far as India, to send delegates to such a people's convention, which is scheduled, unfortunately, for Geneva in 1950. His slogan was, if they won't, we will. World Federalists like these entered the politics of the day. United World Federalists, UWF, was a citizen's lobby designed to influence legislation. It was not until later a 501c3 tax-exempt educational association. The way to educate the public was to support candidates and run for office on a world government platform, as Henry Usborne did. There were hopes that General Dwight Eisenhower, then being courted by the Democrats and the Republicans, might support unity of command as he revealed in his crusade in Europe. Initially, UWF rapidly drew large public participation in expectation, as radio announcer Raymond Graham Swing imagined, of a movement of five, 50 million people. Chapters of UWF sought resolutions favoring U.S. participation in a world federal government at the level of American states. One of these was the Humber Resolution, a non-binding sense resolution passed in 19 states. Another was the Massachusetts type of Humber Resolution, which was brought to the voters in referenda and passed in seven states. The most serious was the California Plan of 1949, when the emerging Cold War was forcing the World Federalists to more desperate action. The plan was to pass binding state resolutions to amend the U.S. Constitution to make possible American participation in a higher union, rather like provisions in the new constitutions of Germany, France, and Japan. It passed in six states, California, Maine, New Jersey, North Carolina, Florida, and Connecticut. At the time of the Korean War, it was pending in 11 more, Wisconsin, Ohio, Minnesota, Utah, Iowa, Michigan, Massachusetts, New York, Washington, Illinois, and Indiana. A radical People's Convention resolution passed in Tennessee. At the U.S. national level, some 16 World Federalist Resolutions were introduced in Congress from 1945 to 1950. The earliest was for a world republic in the spirit of the Chicago Committee. In 
introduced by Senator Glenn Taylor of Idaho, later the vice presidential candidate in the Henry Wallace presidential campaign of 1948. Clarence Streit's group had several Atlantic Union resolutions, which functioned as outliers for Senator Vandenberg's Regional Security Resolution of 1948. That bill actually passed. It became the senatorial consent to the North Atlantic Treaty of April 1949. But reflective of the deep debate over the fundamental foreign policy of the United States at the time was the introduction in June 1949 of the World Federalist Concurrent Resolution in the House, House Concurrent Resolution 64, followed by its Senate version, SCR 56. HCR 64 drew 111 co-sponsors, including two future presidents, John Kennedy and Gerald Ford, and many famous congressional leaders from both parties, Brooks Hayes, Walter Judd, Mike Mansfield, Jacob Javits, John Davis Lodge, Abraham Ribicroft, Christian Herter, Chris Charles Eaton, Peter Rodino, John Voorhees, Henry Jackson, and Franklin D. Roosevelt, Jr. SCR 57 drew 21 co-sponsors, including Charles Toby, Hubert Humphrey, Claude Pepper, John Sparkman, Brian McMahon, Lester Hill, Paul Douglas, and Wayne Morris. Senator J. William Fulbright supported the Atlantic Union Bill. Even Richard Nixon, then a freshman representative, supported a comparable bill. It is true that all these co-sponsored World Federalist Bills were concurrent resolutions that fell short of binding law. But as sense resolutions designed to guide policy, they are instructive. Today, we can hardly imagine a political climate where the like could seriously be considered in Congress. The text is worth remembering. Resolved by the House of Representatives, the Senate concurring, that it is the sense of the Congress that it should be a fundamental objective of the foreign policy of the United States to support and strengthen the United Nations and to seek its development into a world federation, open to all nations, with defined and limited powers, adequate to preserve peace and prevent aggression through the enactment, interpretation, and enforcement of world law. There were hearings on these federalist resolutions in the House in 1948 and 1949 and in the Senate in 1950. In 1948, Secretary of State George Marshall testified against an earlier UWF resolution, HCR 59, simply calling for a general conference of the United Nations to amend its charter in accordance with Article 109. In several hours of taut and grim testimony, Marshall repeatedly rejected proposals to restructure the UN along the lines of world government. The Soviets were not cooperating now, and they could hardly be expected to cooperate further in an elected General Assembly. World community was not ready. The UN was established, Marshall declared, to keep the peace, not to make the peace. This was the State Department's view to the end. Marshall was ably answered by young Marine Corps veteran Cord Meyer Jr., first president of UWF. All great powers, argued Meyer, were unwilling in the new atomic age to shift the responsibility for national defense to a common authority. The National Security Act and the coming Atlantic Alliance were only a stopgap measure to gain time for giving the UN real and effective power. Joseph, a couple of more minutes, please, to wrap up. When asked what if he could make only one change, Meyer replied, do not abolish the veto, make the assembly representative. Thus began the principled World Federalist critique of the coming Cold War. <laughs>
In conclusion, world federalists saw the necessity to go beyond the system of sovereign states to some degree of global democracy to create a world without war. By democracy, they meant a form of government in which the people were represented in the making of the laws. They seized their historic opportunity after the Second World War. The United Nations was seen as too weak to keep the peace. Their vision was a world federal government to achieve unity without sacrificing diversity. They aimed to build public sentiment as the, as the condition for official action. They operated within the legal traditions of the established democracies and upheld the ideal of the rule of world law. The rule of, world of law was seen as the real ground of freedom and security. The, Fed, the uh, Federalist of Hamilton, Madison, and Jay was treated as a guide to the future. Marxism was put aside. Federalists were committed to American leadership to such a departure in international organization. The mainstream were gradualists rather than instant revolutionaries. It was a movement in the center, attracting Republicans and Democrats, businessmen and workers, women, youth, veterans, lawyers, educators, and publicists. The division between capitalists and, and communists they regarded as slipping away as all polities were becoming mixed. The deeper division in the world was between the upholders of national sovereignty and those who recognized the emerging sovereignty of all humanity. The goal was a good world government belonging to the people. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you for those very thoughtful remarks. Um, it brought back to my, to my memory at least, uh, some of the more interesting substantive, why not to say, uh, beautiful passages from your, from your book, uh, your two volume book on the politics of World Federation. I'm sure there will be uh, questions and comments later on, but let's move now to Andreas uh, Bamo, please. Thanks, first of all, Augusto for the introduction and thanks to Sam and the Pardis Center for organizing this terrific online symposium on the crisis of the nation state and democracy. In the next uh, 15 minutes or so, I will be speaking about UN Parliamentary Assembly as a starting point for a world parliament. Primarily, my aim is to provide an introduction to this proposed new assembly. And for this, my starting point is a new policy review that my organization, Democracy Without Borders, published last month. And um, this policy review you can also download from our website. The idea of a world parliament has a long history. This goes back to the French Revolution. I covered that together with Jo Leinen in another book. Um, that's the first part, at least, in that book. And the specific proposal for a UN Parliamentary Assembly was first put forward, actually, in 1949, a few years after the UN's establishment. Um, nonetheless, although it goes back uh, many decades and it has um, lost no relevance, in, in my opinion, quite the contrary, today it seems prophetic that former UN Secretary General Boutros Boutros Ghali said almost 20 years ago that we need to promote the democratization of globalization before globalization destroys the foundation of national and international democracy. And Butras Ghali added that a UN Parliamentary Assembly, a UNPA, has become an indispensable element to achieve democratic control of globalization. Um, this brings us to the first item in this presentation, namely the political objectives of the UN Parliamentary Assembly. At a fundamental level, and there are many objectives, but at the fundamental level, the goal is to expand the right to democracy that is enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and other instruments to the global level. Today, the UN and other global institutions are exclusive club of government representatives, and a UN Parliamentary Assembly is supposed to address the UN's democratic deficit, 
by strengthening democratic representation and democratic participation at the global level through citizen elected representatives. This leads to a better connection of global governance to citizens and to a stronger legitimacy of the UN. And this in turn, in our opinion, opens the doors towards strengthening both the UN and global governance in general. We anticipate that the UNPA will act as a catalyst for global democratization, integration and reform in view of an intergovernmental system today that is obviously failing to address critical challenges of our time, such as climate change, but also peace and all sorts of others. Key guiding principles for UNPA in our opinion are universality, representation of the people, transnational perspectives, and an evolutionary development. Universality means that we recommend that the UN Parliamentary Assembly should be open to all countries that have a parliament. Representation of the people means that UNPA members are not diplomats delegated by governments, but individual representatives who are not bound by instructions and who are called upon to promote the unity and welfare of humanity and not national interests. A transnational perspective then means that the work of the assembly should be based on transnational political groups, not geopolitical groups like at the UN. It's groups that are established by individual representatives that reflect shared political values and principles. Finally, an evolutionary development means that the UNPA initially may be set up as a modest and largely consultative body whose role can be strengthened over time. The development of the European Parliament is an instructive example to learn from in this regard, and there are many other international parliamentary institutions we can look at as well. In the initial stage, delegates may be elected from the midst of national parliaments and possibly regional parliaments, and possibly um, also yeah, from regional parliaments like the European Parliament, Pan-African Parliament, but the Pan-African Parliament, for instance, itself is composed by national parliaments. Still, implementation of direct elections should be possible at any time. We recommend that at first, each country may decide on its own when to implement direct elections, but in the long run, the objective is to have a universal transition to direct elections everywhere. Once there is a critical mass of directly elected representatives, the UNPA will have sufficient legitimacy to be transformed into a real global parliament that can adopt world law based on a global constitution and a system of global legislation. In the course of this symposium, the idea was put forward that a minimalist world parliament that would only have the power to implement a carbon tax uh, may be possible and the question is then, if we look at a minimalist world parliament of this kind, what level of democratic legitimacy would be needed for this to be acceptable? Is it really 100% direct elections or would it be possible to do this at a lower threshold? That's something for the discussion. In any case, um, at that stage where binding regulation is possible, we should talk of a world parliament or a UN parliament, if you wish, and that helps for a better distinction. The term UNPA is better used for the stages below the threshold of charter revision. Nonetheless, even in the initial stages, the UNPA can, can perform a broad spectrum of important tasks. Specific powers and functions include monitoring of major global developments and um, the implementation of UN programs, parliamentary oversight over the UN system, including the rights to submit questions, to receive information, to summon witnesses, as well as the possibility of setting up committees of inquiry, participation in the preparation of the UN budget by the General Assembly, and in the election of the UN Secretary General and other high level officials of the UN system, drafting and adopting regular reports on the work of the UN system with the possibility of holding hearings on specific issues and making its own recommendations. The decision making of the assembly would be based on majority votes. It would not be engaged in consensus rule. 
uh, like we often have it in intergovernmental treaty negotiations or generally at the UN. In order to balance the share of delegates coming from large and small countries, the allocation of seats should be scaled as it is the case in the European Parliament. In order to guarantee the Assembly's efficiency, we believe that the starting point for any model should be an upper limit in the total number of representatives at about, let's say, 700 to 900 people. We also suggest a minimum number of two seats to be allocated to all states, however large or small they might be, to enable the representation of the parliamentary opposition of each country in so far as such an opposition actually exists. Based on this principle, if you look at the allocation of seats, already um, around half of the total number would be allocated to today's 193 member states. And then the remaining seats can be allocated in different ways using population size as a yardstick. As a result, we would end up with a scaled distribution. Smaller countries would be allocated more representatives per capita than larger ones. In terms of working procedures, the assembly would have plenary meetings, which are prepared by portfolio committees and subcommittees on the most important fields of interest. We envisage that there would be committees on human rights, on the Agenda 2030, on climate change and the environment and global governance reforms, to name just a few possibilities here. The committees can relate to specialized agencies in the UN system working on these matters and the UNPA can help overcome this way, can help overcome some of the existing fragmentation in global governance. In procedural terms, the transnational political groups I mentioned would play a key role because through them, motions would be put forward and seats on the committees um, would be distributed to individual representatives. In order to improve the participation of minorities, opposition parties and civil society, these political groups should be able to co-opt a certain number of consultative members at their own discretion. In addition, we expect that the committees would um, the committee's work would be carried out in close interaction with experts, civil society, and other stakeholders. So here would be an additional entry point for them into the UN system, an entry point that is largely independent from UN member states. And of course, having said that, this would be complementary to existing arrangements. If uh, delegates are selected by parliaments at the beginning, and depending on many other variables, we estimate an initial budget requirement of 20 to 35 million US dollars per year to get a UNPA started. That is really a bargain price, if you ask me. Among experts, there has been a lot of discussion as to what is the best legal way to establish a UNPA. Three main options are under review in this regard. First, a decision of the UN General Assembly according to Article 22 of the UN Charter. Second, a standalone treaty, an intergovernmental treaty. And third, a charter reform or review based on Article 109. Um, to a degree, I think that this discussion is a distraction and a little bit too theoretical, the legal pathways. Um, generally, there is an agreement on the long-term goal of a global parliament amongst advocates of the UNPA. To get this established, it is no question that a charter review according to Article 109 will be needed. Sharia Sharai will tell us more about this in a moment's time. Still, I think it needs to be taken into account that even in the case of European integration, it took decades for the European Parliament to emerge as a directly elected co-legislative body of the European Union. Certainly, we want to achieve as much as possible, as quickly as possible, and we should seize all opportunities but in my opinion, it is out of sync with historical experience and current political conditions to expect that we can jump from nothing today to a global parliament in an instant. I also think that this notion is actually risky because a step-by-step -step approach will allow us to learn and adjust the body over time. Also, we need to recognize, this is really an important point, that in many countries, free and fair direct elections simply are not possible. Democracy at the level of nation states is a precondition for a world parliament and world federalism. It has been pointed out several times in the symposium 
um, that historically one of the biggest obstacles just now, um, we heard it, heard it from Joseph, was the fact that the Soviet Union was a totalitarian state. So this really needs to be taken into account today as well. So for this reason, I think that it is good to first aim at a largely consultative body that is formally attached to the UN, according to the objectives and principles and functions I outlined um, before. And after struggling with this question, once again, we've confirmed in our study that I mentioned that in our assessment using Article 22 of the UN's charter is the best option that we should pursue at this moment in time. Coming to a conclusion, I'd like to point out that the proposal of a UN Parliamentary Assembly has received support from over 1,500 members of parliament from over 100 countries, numerous former heads of state and foreign ministers, hundreds of university professors and experts, former UN officials and institutions such as the European Parliament. And more recently, it was also endorsed in civil society's UN 75 People's Declaration. Having said all this, the key political task remains to get a UNPA on the UN's agenda in the first place. This is what we are working on and you are invited to join our efforts. Perhaps one final remark before I finish. Certainly, it must be recognized that the UNPA is a piece in a larger puzzle. We do not believe that the UNPA on its own is a silver bullet that will rescue democracy and solve the world's problems. On the other hand, we do indeed believe that without the UNPA and global democratization, this will not be possible. Thank you very much for listening. I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you for such a comprehensive overview of, um, of the idea of a World Parliamentary Assembly, or as you call it, a UN Parliamentary Assembly. Uh, you have raised a number of very interesting questions. And um, as you were speaking, uh, and in particular, when you referred to the European experience um, with its own Parliamentary Assembly, um, you know, it took something like 21 years, from 1958 to 1979, um, to actually get uh, to the point of direct elections of parliamentarians. And along the way, of course, you also saw a significant strengthening of the powers that were granted to, the, to this body. From the early period when it was largely, I think, a debating society, to the 1980s and 1990s and the, and the present, where the European Parliament, of course, has you know, substantial legislative powers. So we have that model to work with. I think your ideas are very timely. Uh, we have the experience of Europe as, as an indication of how, with political will, something that would appear at the outset to be insurmountable and very ambitious can, in fact, be done. Uh, we will now go to Shariar, Share, uh, in the next uh, sort of logical sequence of this of this conversation. Um, Shariar, please. First, uh, I would like to thank the organizers, Sandy and Michael Holmes for putting this wonderful symposium together. I know they have been working on it for two years. Uh, and I've learned a lot from our colleagues and friends in the past two days. It's been wonderful. What I hope I can contribute to this dialogue and the important discussion of sovereignty of the states versus sovereignty of the people and the cardinal need for bringing people representation to global governance is hopefully to introduce a gateway of how we may get from here to there. During these three days, um, uh, we have had wonderful discussions on both com concepts and solutions with intriguing details of how we can have a world peace where rule of law and justice prevails. But we are also able to tackle other global challenges such as climate change. Michael Bess earlier reminded us that climate change may in fact be a unifying factor in bringing us together. In my own panel today, Andres Brumel discussed how we can get to a world parliament different steps. Professor Barata also gave us examples and we discussed that these ideas are 
new and some of them not so new. In fact, since 1940s, we've had wonderful plans from the Chicago team on framing a global constitution um, to the classic book of world peace through world law by Sohan and Clark and more recent suggestions from our own today's moderator, Augusto and his colleagues who have a great book and plan for how to reform and transform the UN to be fitted for 21st century. Uh, many of these pro proposals are brilliant, but how do we get there? In most democracies, actually in all of them, in order to remain democracies, there's always a change process. This change process is typically embedded in their constitution, that how to change the president, for example, next Tuesday, the prime minister, how to have elections for legislation, and how to adopt human rights to protect them, and how to change the constitution itself. Uh, in international and global governance, this change process is not only opaque, but in most cases, non-existent. At the height of respect for international law during the 1940s through 60s, uh, H.L. Hart, a prominent legal scholar, in his concept of law book, characterize international law as primitive. For one, international law has no uh, clear lawmaking features. Uh, but more so, he was critical that international law has no secondary rules to govern the primary rules and how primary rules can be interpreted and changed. In other words, no change control process of how the law gets changed. If I may add, the lawmaking international is often not legitimate. Obviously in our audience here, legitimacy would have meant that the people are sovereigns as well as the states, that the power should be shared in some sort of co-decision making system, therefore legitimizing how global citizens are ruled. But even leaving the people aside as legitimizers in the existing governance of nation states, the principle of equal sovereignty of states is often a myth, meaning an apartheid system where the permanent fives of this world are more equal than others, leaving all the weaker states as subordinates. Okay. Yeah, treaties being the highest form of international law are usually made this fashion one or two economic or military superpowers get together, negotiate their objectives and set the framework. Then they co-opt one or two other superpowers. By the time they invite other states to the treaty negotiation, in fact, all the important rules and objectives are set and the weaker states participation is mostly symbolic and you're subject to accession to the treaty rather than that, that of an active negotiator or stakeholder. A good old example of this is the creation of the UN treaty itself. It really was Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin who agreed to the UN framework. By the time the Dumbarton Oaks and the Yalta Conference were held, everything was decided. China and France were then co-opted and in San Francisco, the other states were seeing the charter proposal for the first time. Further during the conference, formally and formally, they were told certain parts of the charter, for example, the powers and scope of the proposed Security Council and who runs it is untouchable. Yeah, the more recent example uh, is the case of WTO formation. A few of the economic superpowers created it, got together, created it, set the rules and invited others to join. The long queue of the smaller states forming at the door in Geneva did not want to be left out of the world trade, being fully aware that they had nothing to do with the WTO formation. And their goal is only acceptance and accession. 
This was also true of the UN, but after its creation, the former so-called enemy states, such as Italy, Germany, Spain, Japan, and tens of former colonies were rushing to join the UN. It was not necessarily that they thought the UN was an en enchanted place, as the British foreign minister said in uh, San Francisco, or believed in the Security Council, but it was a way for them to legitimize their identity and existence in international community. This topic of few powerful states setting the rules for everyone else is indeed the manifestation of the fact that international law, as compared to the domestic law, is not based on rule of law, but rather rule by law. Further, the big guys have escape scenarios. If any superpower feels that this treaty or legal regime does not serve their purpose, they abandon it and create another one. For example, the General Agreement on Trades and Tariffs, the GATT, under the United Nations is abandoned and the World Trade Organization outside of the UN is created. The superpowers created and the smaller powers follow. Or the way International Criminal Court was created. Again, the ICC was created outside of the UN and the three biggest of the permanent powers, USA, Russia, and China, ensured that they are outside of its jurisdiction. Yet another tool used uh, by states to undermine international law, especially the P5 states who can get away with it, is simply leaving a treaty or an agreement without any consequences. For example, the recent case of the outright US withdrawal from the Paris Accords, or simply not abiding with their treaty obligations without any conse consequences. For example, this may be the case for Russia or China in four or five years time, not reaching their NDC carbon targets, and there are no penalties or consequences. Let's go back to our pivotal discussion here. How do we introduce system change in global governance? In some of the solutions we have introduced, how do we get from here to there? in absence of a global government, hierarchical legal order, absence of judiciary, and most importantly, denying the people as a stakeholders in some sort of legislative body and absence of the constitution, searching for an answer would be most challenging and dreadful. The closest we think we have to a world government kind of, is the United Nations. Let's rewind to 1945. Most states to varying degrees were looking up to the UN they were creating to be a democratic and a mini world government. Hence, not only peacekeeping, but also economic, cultural, scientific, and human rights. They were all mentioned to varying degrees somewhere in the charter and were supposed to be a larger part of a UN's vision, vision and mission for the future. In fact, Economic and Social Council, the ECOSOC, was able to, um, uh, for, I'm doing, I'm doing on time, I'm doing okay, okay. Uh, the ECOSOC was to be one of the three main pillars of the UN in parallel to the Security Council. But examining the details, the dignitaries and leaders in San Francisco who are also the ambassadors of hope for the rest of the world community were very well knew, they were very well aware that the proposed charter has birth defects, that the charter despite its preamble does not enshrine any of the human rights and does not give any representation or legislative power to the pe people that the judiciary has limited competency and is not universal and cannot sit on contention cases if belligerent states refuse to accept the court's jurisdiction. That further, anything the court decides, it's at the mercy of Security Council to be enforced. 
This was seen in the case of Nicaragua versus US in 1980s. That the only lawmaking body of the UN is the Security Council under Chapter 7, where it allows the permanent five to make instant international law for others. But as to themselves, they can stay above the law. With this awareness, soon there was a rebellion in San Francisco against some charter deficiencies and especially against the Security Council being proposed. According to our research, over 60% of the state in San Francisco were opposed to the Security Council powers, scope, and voting procedures. The majority of states under the leadership of Dr. Evett of Australia included almost all of the Latin American countries, particularly Brazil, Cuba, Colombia, Chile, and Mexico. And in Asia, India, Iran, Turkey, and Philippines. And there was really nobody else from Asia except China. Everybody else was either not invited or they were colonies. And in Europe, we had Netherlands and Belgium uh, very much against the Security Council. Mindful that many states, including the Global South, were not invited, that only 50 states were accredited at the conference, of which over 30 had either spoken against or introduced formal motions against the proposed Security Council. anti veto states, recognizing the circumstances and witnessing hanging of Mussolini on the first week of the conference, surrender of the Germany in the second week of the conference, and the war scenes they were shown every night at the UN theater uh, next to the Opera House in San Francisco. All they had in their mind, get this UN up and running and reform it at a later date. The Dumbarton Oaks proposal had an amendment clause as a means for change, which was meant for limited surgical changes and was subject to the veto to be adopted. So the P5 could have vetoed it. But the proposal did not have any general charter review of constitutional reform clauses. The majority weaker states, with the help of the US, whom at that time still believed in the Franklin Roosevelt vision of a UN and its role in global governance, in the last couple of weeks of the conference adopted a US proposal for Article 109 to be added to the charter for a review and revision process in the future. Uh, I'm going to read you parts of Article 109 in paragraph one. It reads, a general conference of the members of the United Nations for the purpose of reviewing the present charter may be held at the place and uh, date to be fixed by a two thirds vote of the members of the General Assembly. So the idea was a general conference. Everything would be on the table. Disarmament, climate change, human rights, accord, anything. But the char charter reformers uh, were not satisfied. They fought hard and got paragraph three added to the US proposal. Paragraph three reads, if such a conference has not been held before the 10th annual session of the General Assembly, Following the coming into force of the present charter, the proposal to call such a conference shall be placed on the agenda of that session of the General Assembly. So this is the paragraph three. Then it goes on to explain the voting for this provision, which uh, there is no veto of the permanent five to hold the review conference, and it has a simple majority to convene it. Came 1955, the charter reformists seized the moment. Article 109 was operated on and got adopted as resolution 992X, and that X stands for 10 sessions of the General Assembly. By a large majority at General Assembly, at the Security Council, Soviet Union casted uh, the only no vote. But remember, no veto was allowed to convene the review conference. Therefore, the review was also adopted at the Security Council. That high hope 
was dashed by P5 tactically and procedurally delaying the conference year after year for 12 years until it was put sort of on pause until further notice in 1967. And this was a general assembly resolution that said the conference is in being, but we are not setting a date to when to have it. Up to today, the UN has never had a review of its charter. According to our legal research at CUNCR, the San Francisco promise of holding a review is indeed still in force. And the member states, by not having it, are in breach of the charter. Fast forward to today and the global governance in crisis, the UN reform is dead. It died in late 1960s. After two amendments to the charter, when the US under Nixon Kissinger administration decided the charter should not change and remain frozen. This was a big relief to Russia. Since, since 1945, they didn't want any changes to the job. The UN reform proposals since have been rather soft and don't have any underpinning legal basis and have been very fragile. Perhaps this could be the explanation of why these efforts of the past decades have been ineffective to beat global challenges such as nuclear disarmament, pro prohibition of wars, mitigation of uh, conflicts, migrations because of conflicts, extreme poverty, protection of human rights, protection of rule of law, and last but not least, climate change. Then what is to be done? After a long research, I found my way back to the Charter Article 109, particularly Charter paragraph three. Is one a minute gift. to wrap up. Okay, sure. Yeah, Article three is a gift. What could happen in a Charter review? Uh, it probably could lead to gradual changes like mitigation and emulation of the veto, institutional changes for better governance of pandemics, uh, international court on the environment. But for us world federalists, it might also lead to a constitutional moment, similar to the Philadelphia Convention in the US history, the Meiji Revolution in Japan history, and the Maastricht Treaty in EU history. Yes, UN Charter Review with great dynamics and potential that it creates seems to be legitimate forum and our legal path to move away from fragmented and unjust global governance towards a democratic federal world government. If you allow me, I will end by citing a poem from Rumi 700 years ago, who said, I have a covenant with happiness for happiness to be mine. I have a covenant with the collective lives for the collective lives to be mine. Yes, our lives and lives of all beings are interdependent and we can only have peace when we have world peace. Thank you. Thank you, Shariar. Beautiful. Um, if, you. I, if I may begin this, uh, section on uh, Q&A, uh, picking up on a question that was submitted by Tiziana Stella, um, directed to you, Shariar, but I want to broaden the scope of the, of the question. So if you allow me, Tiziana, I will, I will uh, actually direct a question to all three uh, panelists. Um, all of you have presented um, very creative, very interesting, and some would say very ambitious proposals, uh, you know, to reform the current um, UN architecture. Um, what I'd like to ask you to comment on, and please limit your remarks to a couple of minutes because we want to do other things, is to what extent is the current moment uh, in the middle of a global pandemic, what we have witnessed in 2020 over the last eight months, to what extent has this crisis perhaps uh, enabled a more supportive environment for the kinds of reforms that all of you are putting on the table and are proposing? Let me give you an example to illustrate what, what I have in mind. I am an economist. Um, 
uh, in the early part of my career, I worked at the International Monetary Fund. And uh, over the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years in academic circles and other uh, uh, multilateral organizations, there has been a very interesting debate about whether our system of social protection is, is good enough and is conducive enough you know, to provide adequate levels of human welfare. And in that debate, there has been a discussion of you know, universal basic income, you know, a, a, a safety net for all of mankind. And that idea traditionally has been perceived as being way out there, you know, uh, something, a pipe dream, something to think about in the next 100 years. Much to my surprise, a recent IMF document, and this is significant because the IMF is a most conservative institution. The IMF essentially speaks of the need to have a universal safety net, that it is one of the lessons that has emerged out of the current crisis, that when a certain portion of humanity is, is devoid of social protection, does not have access to universal health care, does not have access to sick leave and, and other such social benefits, they put at risk everybody else. Right? And so this is a major seismic shift in thinking in the last six, seven months. So my question to you, Andreas, Joseph, Shariar, two minutes. Um, do you, in some, in some sense, feel more optimistic about the proposals that you have put against the background of what has happened in the last eight months? Well, it's often said that, um, as John Monet said, uh, for the hard work of uniting sovereignties, human beings will not act without a crisis. Um, and it does strike me as a student of history, over since, particularly since 1945, that um, a nuclear weapons is not a sufficient crisis. And I, I think that COVID-19 is not a sufficient crisis. Only if one million people have perished and in the Spanish flu epidemic in 1918-19 cost 50 million people. And yet nothing seems to happen. Um, am I, uh, do I see uh, optimism in an IMF uh, consideration of the of, uh, a failure of safety nets? Uh, uh, well, uh, a little bit. Uh, similarly, uh, in the World Trade Organization, I've, I've thought that, well, the introduction of, of conflict resolution panels shows that the humanity is really beginning to uh, find a way to act together. Am I optimistic? Um, no, I'm not. I, uh, I'm a student of history. I, uh, uh, history is a series of disasters, which sometimes provoke uh, real change. Um, I'm dreadfully frightened. Um, I, um, I don't see, I think we'll, what we'll do is just neglect climate change and cooperation we will not see any rule of law to enforce agreements. Uh, no, we'll just drift and one disaster will fall another until the ecosystem is completely destroyed. Uh, I, I think humanity as, a, as an organism that uh, evolved on a little planet around a minor sun is uh, headed for the end. That's, uh, I'm not optimistic, no. Thank you, Joseph, for those sobering observations. Um, um, Andreas. Well, thank you. <clears throat> it's my job to be optimistic just so to, I can actually pursue my job. Otherwise, I would have to choose a different career. So, but let's be realistic. Um, what we are doing is we are preparing the expertise, the political momentum and network. So we are ready if ever a window of opportunity occurs. COVID is not this window of opportunity. We would hope that was the case, but it's not. Um, in reality, there, I mean, there are lots of things going on. In reality, what's happening, we have a rise in authoritarian, authoritarianism. This is not only Trump, but China and Russia are expanding their influence. So this does, 
does not go away with the US elections if there is a new administration. Um, so democracy is heavily under pressure. And let's make no mistake, how will world government come about? I will exclude one, one single option that is totally excluded, and I'm speaking of democratic world government. It will not come about by force. We cannot force any country to join a world government that is subjugating national sovereignty. So what we need is a social dynamics that pulls countries into such a system over time. And I believe that the UN Parliamentary Assembly is an element of creating such a dynamics. And so our focus should really be on strengthening democracy because with countries that are authoritarian, even totalitarian, with such countries, we cannot and we should not wish to build supranational government. And we are far away from that goal still, unfortunately. Thank you, Andreas. Sharia, your turn. Two minutes. Yes, uh, we heard uh, Joseph, the historical point of view, Andreas, uh, optimistic point of view, and I have my legal point of view. I say the charter tells us what to do in case of, for example, this uh, COVID-19 situation. We have big issue with World Health Organization in terms of its finances, that which countries come and go, how it's governed, but it's doing wonderful job. So we can start with WHO. We take it to the charter review. How can we have a good World Health Organization? It needs money, it needs uh, uh, some sort of democracy in uh, its good management. But then what I, suspect would happen at the charter review, which is concentrating, focusing on COVID-19, that they see that they cannot really solve anything unless they solve everything, which means independent financing for the UN, people's representation at the UN, uh, taking away some of the, you know, the ills of the Security Council. So then the scope becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. They start with COVID-19 and WHO, how to reform it, or, you know, the climate change, but it, the scope becomes bigger and bigger. And that's uh, really the way governments are created. They need to solve a lot of problems. So I think the starting point could be the Charter Review. All right. Um, let me let me uh, make a comment that I hope will give all of us uh, a bit of optimism about the future, and then and then I will I will challenge you with a with a proposal or a question and, and invite uh, the response from from any of you or as many of you as you would like to care to comment. You know that. Um, a lot of interesting data has been collected in the last eight months uh, on a whole range of issues about you know the impact of COVID and someone um, has actually managed to look at <clears throat> successful cases of management of the of the pandemic um, you know countries like uh, um, New Zealand and uh, Finland and uh, Norway and Germany and Iceland and Taiwan in the, in the Far East. And the observation has been made that all of these countries are actually run by women, either heads of state or prime minister. And so beyond this, they have observed that, in fact, although women only make something like 10% of all prime ministers and heads of state among the 193 members of the United Nations, they actually account for 40% of the successful cases of management of COVID. In fact, if you go beyond this, if you look at the mortality data uh, in those countries run by women, it is six times lower than in the rest of the countries. And so, this has sort of led some, and I find myself among them actually, to ask whether one of the problems that we have, and that explains partly the pessimism of Joseph, uh, Andreas, 
perhaps to some extent Sharia, is that over the last several hundred years we have basically been running, uh, we have, we have uh, the, the world has been run by, by men with their own particular definitions of, for instance, what is the meaning of uh, well-being? What is the meaning of security? Our approach to security has largely been uh, militaristic in, 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 in spirit and in action. We think of security and immediately we men tend to frame the debate in terms of armies and weapons and so on. Whereas in places like Germany and Norway and Finland and New Zealand and Taiwan, apparently security has a different meaning. It is framed in terms of human welfare, in terms of uh, uh, social and economic well-being, not necessarily the militar militaristic dimension. So is part of the solution over the longer term to encourage the economic and especially political empowerment of women? Um, is, uh, would that make you a bit more optimistic, uh, Joseph, Andreas, Shariar, if we saw uh, more and more women in positions of authority and power running corporations and running governments? Uh, or is this a side issue? Uh, I'm not going to ask Joseph and Andreas and Shariar to comment on this because we have heard them. I'm going to open it up to anybody who would like to uh, comment on this, please. I guess I just I, I want to second what you said and and say as uh, a co-organizer to this conference along with Michael Holm, it's one of my regrets that we didn't put together a panel on precisely what you're talking about, Augusto. Um, that is global feminism uh, and uh, you know the recognition of the human rights of women. Um, in the modern era, because I think it's a very important part of the U Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, I think it's a very important part of the history of world federalism prior to World War II uh, with Rosika Schwimmer and other uh, uh, feminists um, uh, uh, who, were, who were pushing for a, a people's world government, a world parliament. Um, and I think a big aspect of the resurgent authoritarianism that we see uh, with Trump or Bolsonaro or Duterte uh, or the figures in, in Europe has a lot to do with the kind of gender reaction of uh, men reasserting their right to pound their chest, et cetera, et cetera. I'm gonna stop, but I just wanna share those, those thoughts about what you just said, so. Thank you, Richard. Let that, be, let that be a session at the next conference. Uh, thank you uh, for participating in this discussion, and I very much uh, look forward to future engagements.